and turn your Bibles to the book of Zechariah. If you hit the end of the Old Testament, that's Malachi. The very next book back to the left is Zechariah and go to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah 12 and verse 1. It says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Now, um, you know, this is talking about a future day that is yet coming. You know, um, uh, we'll probably see it in just a moment. Um, the Lord talks about gathering all the nations against Jerusalem. You know, um, in this last uprising that has occurred since October 7th, um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of groups. I mean, the hatred is off the chart around the world, but... Not all the nations are against Israel at this point. But there is a day coming at the end of the tribulation period when there will be a replay of what just happened on October 7th. The only difference will be that all the nations will gather against Jerusalem and then the Lord's going to step in. Um, so this is the this is sort of the time period here that the Lord is referring to. Um, in verse 3, it says... And in that day, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people? In other words, they'll really wish they hadn't messed with Israel. And in that day, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people? All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day, saith Lord, and he, and he goes on. Um, verse 3, you see the words in that day. Verse 4, you see the words in that day. 20 times in the book of Zechariah, the phrase in that day appears. Six of those are in this chapter. And uh, in that day. And man, that is a reference to the end of the tribulation period and the second coming, the second advent. You know, the, the second coming of the Lord is in two parts. The first will, part will be the rapture, which is what we're looking for. And then the second part will be uh, seven years later when Jesus actually comes all the way down to the earth and sets up his throne there. But you see the time period that he's referring to. He says, in that day. Um, look at verse 9. In verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day that I, that's the Lord, will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. You know, we're not, we're not really going to talk about this tonight. I'm just touching on it because we're because this is where we are in the context. Um, but man, there's just some things you, you just can't miss unless you're trying to miss it on purpose. You, you just can't miss it. The Lord has determined eternally that he will defend Jerusalem. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. That's, that's some serious mourning when you're mourning for your only son. And shall be in bitterness for him 
as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this passage. And Lord, it's just exciting just to read it. And Lord, in Jesus' name, help us, Lord, with the subject at hand. And God, make it a reality. And I pray a help to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to draw your attention to verse 10 and um, the first part of the verse. It says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. In this passage, it says God is going to pour something out. And, of course, the context is the last days. Now, the context, of course, of Zechariah 12 is really, you know, way far at the end. Uh, but we are in the last days. Um, and, and later on tonight, we'll, we'll actually hit a verse. Uh, I, I just don't want to seem like I'm stretching the, the, the text here. I'm, I'm going to make a spiritual application of this text tonight. Um, directly, specifically, this is talking about the end of the tribulation. All the nations close in. And uh, man, the Lord does a wonderful thing. And in that moment that he comes back to finally, once and for all, take care of business, he, he not only defends them, but he pours out the spirit of grace and supplication on them. You know, we are uh, the Lord's people and um, and we are in the last days. And, um, uh, you know, God pours out the spirit of grace in those last days, the spirit of grace and supplication. He he pours it out. You know, um, anything that we're going to, anything good we're going to do, uh, anything um, anything amazing we're going to get from God, and we're praying for some amazing things. I know some of you guys personally, I mean, I don't have a clue, but I think most of it, you're praying for some amazing things. You're praying for some things that if God does it, you'll know God did it. And uh, we're praying. And you know what? What really we're looking for, we need, uh, we need God to pour out grace. Um, because it's not going to be because of any good thing we are or any good thing we have done. You know, at our best state, we're all together vanity. Um, you know, we are eat up with uh, our faults and flaws and thank God for the new man. But we still have the old man and we battle with that and we, we don't always do so well. But thank God he doesn't deal with us in light of all our failures. Um, one great man of long ago said, you know, before we got saved, our unworthiness did not block God's favor. How much more now that we are saved? We are his people and our unworthiness still yet will not block his favor. In the last days, God pours out the spirit of grace. And boy, it's really interesting to watch how that word spirit appears. Um, man, it turns up all over the place and 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 many times in the Old Testament. The spirit, the word spirit, the root of that word literally means to breathe or to blow. And that matches what happens in John chapter 20, verse 22. Jesus Christ appears on the day of his resurrection to his disciples and they're gathered together for fear. Man, he begins to encourage them. It says, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And then it says, he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. The word spirit, literally the root of that word in the English dictionary, the root of that word is to breathe or to blow. The spirit Spirit deals with excitement or life or fire. It animates. If somebody is spirited, they're animated. If a horse is spirited, that means that thing's pretty lively. You want to be careful about getting on it. Uh, spirit gives momentum. Spirit is a leaning of the mind. We say so-and-so has a forgiving spirit. That means they just naturally lean that way. It's a leaning of the mind. Spirit is an eager desire towards a certain thing. And of course, it is a reference to the, the influences of the Holy Spirit. And of course, when the Holy Spirit is at work, there is life and fire. And man, he influences our mind and he creates eager desire. And, and that is the spirit 
of the Lord. You know, in Ezekiel 37, you have that famous vision uh, that Ezekiel had of the dry bones in that valley. And, um, and you know, the Lord says, prophesy to these bones. And, and, and uh, the Lord says, Ezekiel, can these bones live? <laughs> and Ezekiel gave the right answer. He said, oh, Lord, thou knowest. And uh, he says, Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones. And, man, they start coming together, and then flesh comes on the bones. But the Bible says that they were still just bodies laying on the ground. To have many, many, many bones in a valley, and the Bible says they were very dry, it meant it had been a battlefield. And they were dead, old, dry. The Bible specifies dry bones. These people have been dead a long time. And their bones were all mixed up and mangled up and you know, you couldn't have put it together if you tried. You wouldn't know which bone, which skeleton. But he prophesies according to the word of the Lord. Man, those bones come together. Flesh comes on the bones. But they're still not breathing. They're still not living. And the Lord says to Ezekiel, prophesy unto the wind. And he said, and I prophesied. And suddenly something happened and those dead bodies came alive. And of course, the Lord made the application. He says, this is the this is the people of Israel. And God says, I'm going to bring life into them. And he specifically says in the context, he said, my spirit, my spirit. The spirit. Brings life. And he says, I will pour out the spirit of grace, the spirit of grace. Grace is just the favor of God. It's, it's asking for things and it's asking for things. Really, we have no right to ask. You know, the, the, the dictionary definition is grace is undeserved favor. Well, that just means you're asking for something that really you don't deserve at all. It's you, you got no right even to ask it. For by grace are you saved through faith. And, and grace is to be asked for. Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time. The Lord says, come boldly. He says, you don't deserve a thing. But he said, but my son is taking care of all that. He said, you're in him and he's pleading on your behalf. And your sins are washed away. Come boldly. You say, I had a bad day yesterday. He said, that's okay. It applies any day of the week. Come boldly. You say, I feel like a failure. He said, that's okay. Come boldly. He says, because what, what I'm going to give you, you don't deserve it anyway. And he said, no, I'd delight to give. Come boldly unto the throne of grace. The throne of grace. It is the spirit of grace is something that comes from the Lord. He he's going to pour out in those last days the spirit of grace. He pours it out. It is to be asked for in Psalm 84. It says the Lord will give grace and glory. In James 4, 6, it says he giveth more grace. Keep your place there in Zechariah and go to 1 Peter chapter 5. If you hit the, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and back up, you'll see uh, Jude and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Then you'll be in 1st and 2nd Peter. 1st Peter 5. Grace. You know, uh, in Zechariah chapter 12, um, this the whole context, and, you, and boy, I just some of the most amazing chapters in the Bible are at the tail end of Zechariah. And the Lord describes in detail that final battle at Armageddon and how he steps in. And you know, when he pours out the spirit of grace and supplication, it is, a, it is the height of the most tragic time that Israel will ever face. You know, Israel lost on October 7th. I'm, I'm going to get the number wrong. Um, I just saw it the other day. Um, 
Is it is it is it five hundred people? Does anybody know? Twelve twelve hundred. They lost twelve hundred. Um, but the Lord tells you in the book of Zechariah. Uh, he just gives you in one verse. He tells you about what's going to happen, and the Lord tells you what's going to happen to the women, and the Lord tells you how. Just he gives you he gives you a fractional number of how many people are going to die. And it's it's going to make it's going to make October seventh look look like you know not much. And it's in this terrible time that God says, "I will pour out the spirit of grace and supplication." Look at First Peter five, verse five. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you, be subject one to another and be, be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace. He giveth grace unto the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And one of the things you see there is that grace walks with someone or something being exalted. When grace comes into the picture, something is exalted. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, God took Joseph and he took him from the prison house. And man, in 24 hours, Joseph is second on the throne in Egypt and he's exalted. But God didn't exalt him just because, you know, he wanted to make Joseph look tremendous and, and make make Joseph the hero of the day. Uh, Joseph said, I know why God did it. He did it to preserve life. He did it to save much people alive. And grace exalted Joseph. God exalted Daniel, took him from the captives. And uh, man, you, you don't read far into the book of, of Daniel and suddenly same thing. Uh, da Daniel is at the, man, he is in the ruling echelon. And uh, he serves under, uh, I think it was three or four kings. And it's just amazing. And why did God do that? Because he wanted to reflect his glory, not Daniel's glory. God says, I, I'm going to glorify me. My, it'll be about my glory in a heathen kingdom. In Isaiah 42, the Lord said, my glory, I will not give unto another. Now, God will exalt. You know, grace has to do with exaltation. Great, you know, humble yourselves that God may exalt you. And when God does that, um, and, and God does that, he exalts. Man, he takes beggars out of the dunghill and puts them with kings. And um, But he does it for his glory. Yeah. And grace has to do not only with somebody being exalted, but it has to do with power. Look at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And um, a miracle has been done here. And, uh, and uh, Peter and John, you know, they, they take some heat. Uh, because it caused quite a stir and the, the rulers of the Jews were not happy about it. And in Acts 4, um, verse 23, it says, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they, the, 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 the church group, when they, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? 
The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For I have a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus." You notice that colon there. And great grace was upon them all. Man, the Lord pours out grace. And man, you know, sometimes that meant people were exalted to a place where they could get something done. And, and in other times it meant that God suddenly gave his people power to preach the word and to do great things for him. And uh, it was grace. Great grace was upon them. In Zechariah, it says God pours out the spirit of grace and the spirit of supplications. Supplications. Supplication, you often see the word prayer and the word supplication in the same verse. And supplication is when prayer goes to a whole new level. Uh, you know, we could uh, we could be in here tonight and and, um, you know, we could have somebody who's uh, who's whose child is sick and uh, and somebody says, Pastor, you know, they they just took so and so's kid to the emergency room. Let's pray. And so we we all you know, we all get together and we pray and, and we're serious about it. We we feel the need. Uh, we we really pray seriously about it. Um, but, you know, the the parents of that child. Um, you know how they're going to pray? Their prayer is going to go to a whole new level. And their prayer is, is not just going to be, um, you know, just some general compassion. Um, it's, it's going to be urgent. It's going to be intense. I mean, they're going to be praying. I, a few years ago, um, a guy, a preacher that I met many, many years ago, uh, one of his sons got hit by a car. And he was right there. And it was summertime. People were outside. And his son gets hit. And he's not breathing. And, and, and it's, it's bad. And he's holding his son. And the paramedics are there. And he's not breathing. And of course, about this time, you lose all your inhibition. Oh, if you've ever seen somebody pray at a moment like that, man, there's no inhibitions. And he's holding his son and he's not breathing. And he's tears and he's, he doesn't care who's around. He's going, oh God, I don't deserve for him to live, Lord. Lord, I'm a mess. But oh God, have mercy. Have mercy on my son. Oh God. He started praying. And about 90 seconds later, he started breathing. And he lived and he recovered. You know what that was? That was supplications. That was supplications. That's, that's a whole nother level. Boy, heaven, heaven hears us when, even when we pray. Heaven hears every word we whisper. And let me encourage you there. Had a friend of mine, a farmer in Saskatchewan, and, um, and he was having a bad day. I know you guys never have those, but he was having a bad day. And he was out in the farmyard, so nobody's around. And he lost it. I mean, he was working on this tractor. And this tractor was giving him grief. And, man, he took his tools and started beating on the tractor. And he started swearing. <gasps> you say, <gasps> a Christian? <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> Peter Kirsten swore. <laughs> he did. And this guy's beating on the tractor, and he's swearing at the tractor. And he's just, he's a disaster. And um, he said, 
He said, after I calmed down, he said, after I calmed down, he said, I, I felt lousy. And he said, I thought, I thought God and the angels just heard every word, just heard every word I said. And he said, and the Lord spoke to me. And the Lord said, you, you believe I heard every word, don't you? And he said, yes, Lord, I do. And he said, why don't you believe that I hear every good word you say too? Why don't you believe that I hear you when you talk to me just normal? Why, why don't you believe that I hear that? You know, he hears, he hears, he hears every prayer that we pray. You know what I mean? A barring, barring, you know, and you know, you got some sin in your heart and you're just, you know, I, if you're, you're, uh, you got some request you're praying for, you got a bunch of sin in your life. You're going to have to clear that out of the way. But it says the Lord's going to judge people for every idle word. He hears every word. Supplications. But when somebody steps into the realm of that supplications, that's a whole nother level of praying. And man, that gets heaven's attention. Supplication means to ask with the heart engaged. You know, there's some things we pray and our heart's not really engaged. But when you're supplication, when you're in supplication, your heart is engaged. It means to beg. It means to pray with urgency. It means to ask pressingly and to keep coming and to keep coming and to keep coming. Psalm 119, 58, David said, I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. He said, man, he said, with all my heart, God, he said, you know, you know, that's how I was talking to you. In Daniel chapter nine, you don't have to turn there. We were in Daniel, of course, a few months back in Sunday mornings. And, and you'll remember in Daniel chapter nine, Daniel starts praying and, um, and before the chapter closes, God has sent an angel. And it says three or four times in that chapter, Daniel said, I made my prayer and my supplication. And boy, the angel Gabriel shows up later in that chapter. And he said, we heard your supplications. We heard your supplications. And God says, he will pour out the spirit of grace. You know what? If, if God poured out the spirit of grace and supplication on us, you know what that means he's about to do? I mean, he's about to answer some prayers. I mean, in a big way. Because he's not going to pour that out on you just for nothing. The word is in Zechariah 12, verse 10, I will... Pour, I will pour out the Spirit. Look at Ezekiel 39. You know what? The Lord is generous. Yes. The Lord, you know, He has riches untold. Man, it is not entered into the heart of man, the things that God has. And so, you know, when we when we come to the Lord and we pray, um, there's no um, there's no. The, the Lord's not scampering to grab a loan so he can help you. You know, he's he's not waiting on check to clear. No, he's. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Ezekiel 39, verse 29. Uh, look at verse 27 just to get the context. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, again, he's talking about Israel here, and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, 
Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. Go to, go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. It says, I will pour out the spirit of grace and supplications. Acts chapter 2. This is the day of Pentecost. And of course, uh, man, the, the spirit of the Lord has come. And uh, the men are speaking in. Uh, unknown tongues and, and and those are languages it's they're hearing the word of God in all the languages that they grew up in and uh, they know it's a miracle it's just unbelievable and um, look at verse um, 12 and they were all amazed and were in doubt saying one to another what meaneth this others mocking said these men are full of new wine but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he begins to quote some verses from Joel chapter 2. And it shall come to pass, when? In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens, you know, even the lowly, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And suddenly the context leaps in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 is a, is a tribulation context. Verse 19, And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So he's, he's quoting about the last days but this is this is the early church and man Jesus has just resurrected and you know several weeks earlier and and he's went back to heaven and they've been in the upper room uh, for about a week and they've been praying because the Lord said wait tarry for the promise and what are they doing in that room they're asking he said wait for the promise and they all get together in that room the Lord said wait and so, and there's a promise, there's something coming. And so they pray and they pray and they pray and the spirit comes and it was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. The spirit? Like, like a wind, like breath. And the spirit came. And then, man, just things start happening. And the spirit comes on these guys and suddenly they're doing something that they can't do naturally. You know, when they, when they spoke in tongues, that was the mystery because there in Jerusalem on that day, it was the feast of Pentecost, which was a yearly feast. It was the feast of Pentecost. And there were Jews from every nation under heaven. And he gives the list. So all these Jews were there. But they were all their homelands were other nations and they all spoke various languages. And all of a sudden these guys get up and they start preaching. But but what these they're hearing them speaking in their own languages. And they know these guys aren't linguists. These are fishermen, you know, the common people. Jesus called these men out of these. Low, he didn't call any of them from the local uh, university. And the Spirit of God. And, and what does he do? He says, this is what Joel said would happen 
in the last days, in the last days. You know, when, when the Lord pours out the spirit on somebody, um, man, he really, he really, things start changing that things happen to that person. Um, I want you to look with me real quick at first Samuel chapter 10, first Samuel 10. You know, one of the commands that the Lord gave to, to us, uh, he said, and, and be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be ye filled with the spirit. And you got that comparison, you know, the guy that's drunk with wine, really, he, he becomes a different, different person. You know, you, you know, many of you have seen it and, and some of you that have not, you know, really, really you're blessed, but, but those who've seen it, you know how it is. Um, you know, we used to, we used to work in Northern Ontario and um, a lot of the people that we dealt with were typically uh, culturally very quiet, very shy. Man, they just they they were they were nice to me and my family. We were we were often there um, with them, and we would talk to them. They were friendly, and, but you know they just were very very quiet, very reserved until they got some liquor in them. And man, when they got liquor in them, they became another person. Uh, I called one of my relatives one day and I caught him off guard. And um, I had heard that this particular relative uh, drank a lot, but, you know, she knew I was a pastor. So whenever I was around, she always behaved herself. And, and you know, there was no sign of liquor anytime I was around. But I just called called that house one day and, um, oh, my word, she was she was talking a thousand miles an hour and she would laugh and it wasn't her normal laugh. And. And I'm listening to all this and I'm going, oh, okay, I know what's going on here. She's got some liquor in her system. You know, uh, you know, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. Um, look with me at 1 Samuel 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head. That's upon Saul. And kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? When thou art departed from me today, Samuel says, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin at Zelza. And they will say unto thee, the asses which thou wentest to seek are found. And lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses and sorroweth for you, saying, what shall I do for my son? Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor. And there shall meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel, one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. After that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a, and a pipe and a harp before them and they shall prophesy. Now watch. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee and thou shalt prophesy with them and thou shalt be turned into another man and let it be when these signs are coming to thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. This was one of the sweetest days of Saul's life. Those of you that know the story of Saul, you know as a, as a king, he was a failure. He got two years into his kingdom, and God just literally said, I'm done with this guy. And even though he stayed on the throne for 38 more years after that, it was just a, it was a real terrible thing. For him personally, what happens in this chapter is one of the sweetest days in his life. You know what happened? Man, the spirit of God came on him. And he was turned into another man. You know, the, the Lord said in Zechariah that in the last days, he would pour out the spirit of grace and of supplications. It is poured out. Again, the disciples in the upper room there in Acts chapter 2, the Lord had already promised he was going to do that. 
But you know what they did? They uh, they realized they needed to ask. They needed to ask. What are you what are you what are you asking for in this year? Can I can I encourage you that there is something that we should ask that perhaps maybe maybe you never think to ask. Mm -hmm. And that is that God would pour out something on you. You know, I think some of us are worried that trouble is going to be poured out on us or financial difficulty. Uh, we would ask that the Lord would pour out money on our head or or better circumstances or or all that stuff. But, uh, you know, the Lord did say that in the last days he would pour out something and he would pour it out. He, he wouldn't sprinkle it. He would pour it out. And that is the spirit of grace. And of supplications. Would you ask for that? You know, a lot of Christians, they, they would be the first to admit. They would say, you know, I, I really, you know, I'm not, not what I want to be. Not what I want to be. Um, you know, my, my prayer life isn't the greatest. I hope you're reading your Bible. I don't have the prayer list, the, uh, the Bible reading list out tonight. I, I hope you'll jump on that. I hope you'll, you'll make that a big part of your life because that really plays into all this, man. The, the word of God is a real key element with your, your thoughts and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh as a man thinketh in his heart. So is he, and man, the word of God is that, that, that perfect seed. Now you are clean through the word, which I've spoken unto you. But if you're going to get grace, you know, God's got some things that he wants to give you. He's got some things he wants to give me. Uh, you have not because you ask not. He wants to pour out the spirit of grace and of supplications. Charles Finney said that at one point in some of the revivals that he was having, he said uh, it was very common to find Christians whenever they met in any place, falling on their knees in prayer instead of engaging in conversation. He said, not only were the prayer meetings greatly multiplied and fully attended, and not only were people very serious, it wasn't, it wasn't sleepy, it wasn't joking. He said they were very serious in those meetings, but there was also a mighty spirit of secret prayer. Christians prayed a great deal, and many of them spending several hours in private prayer. He said sometimes two or three of them would get together and make a particular person a subject of prayer. He said it was wonderful to see how their prayers were answered. He said answers to prayer were multiplied on every side and no one could escape the conviction that God was daily and hourly answering prayer. He said, you know, the church would get attacked. And he said if there was any appearance of a root of bitterness springing up or any weird fanaticism that was showing up. He said Christians would immediately sound the alarm and they would give themselves to praying that God would direct and control all things. He said it was surprising to see to what extent and how God removed the obstacles in the way by answering prayers. You know, um, sometimes, um, you know what the Lord does? The Lord answers little prayers. Now, I want you to be honest, okay? Be honest. And, and if you can't remember, that's okay. This is not about, this. oh, I got to look spiritual. No, please don't do that. Anybody in the last two or three weeks have any little prayers that were answered that were really striking that you can remember? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, instantly some hands went up. I saw it last night. We had men's prayer at our house. And um, everybody had left except Hemia and Josiah. And um, so we're sitting in the entryway and we're talking. And there's a little booklet that I had ordered. And I want to put one in, in, in every family's hands. And, uh, and I, Josiah said, you got one handy. And I said, uh, I stood there and thought a minute. And, and then Hemia said, do you have a church? I said, yeah, I do. And then I said, but wait a minute. I said, I've got one in my office. Now, the amazing thing about my office is, is half my office got saved this week because I cleaned it up. 
It was so bad. One side of my office, like I've got a chair and a little footstool there. And, and literally you, you couldn't even get there. It was so piled up. I've joked with my wife, you know, you know, be careful. If you fall in, we may have to send help to get you out of there. And, uh, but you know what? I took it. I took a day this week and man, I went to work on my office and, um, and I got it, got it about half done. It's really, it's, it's nice to walk in there now. And, um, I told Josiah, I said, wait a minute. I've got one of those little books in my office. And I walked into my office and for the life of me, I couldn't spot it. And I had handled it just two hours before on my desk, no less. And I'm, I'm walking in there and I'm looking and I'm flipping papers and I'm moving. And I, I walked back out and I said, man, I can't find it. And it was bugging me. I said, wait just a minute. And I walked back in there and I looked again and I looked every place. I thought, where, where could I have absently mindedly laid it? And I'm looking, you know, and I could not find it. So I come back out and then Josiah says, he says, you know, he says, I lose things a lot. And he said, I, I pray that. God helps me to find him. And he says, he, it, it happens all the time. And he said, um, he said, I really thought you'd find it because I asked the Lord to help you find it. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, okay, one more time. I walk in there and I literally walk straight to it. That wasn't my prayer. That was Josiah's prayer. Do you know why the Lord does that? I think I know part of the reason why. Is because there's some big things we're praying for, and sometimes those things are slow in coming. Not always, but there are things that sometimes we pray long for. And those things get discouraging because you think, why isn't the Lord answering? And so the Lord wants you to know that He is indeed answering. So He lets these little things happen. These little things. And you pray and He answers. And you pray and He answers. And it's just little things. And, you know... And he just lets you know, yeah, I'm, I'm still hearing you. I'm still the prayer answering God. And it says in Luke 18, the Lord spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And he told the story about the widow woman and the unjust judge and how she kept pestering that judge and, and he wouldn't help her and he wouldn't help her and he wouldn't help her. And finally he said, phooey, and he helped her. And then the Lord said this, And shall not God avenge His own elect, though He bear long with them? Boy, there's some things you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray. And the Lord says, don't stop. Don't stop. You say, boy, I've been praying about this situation for a long time. Don't stop. Keep asking. Lord says, I will pour out the spirit of grace. You know, one thing we should all pray for this year. If there's any part of most of our Christian lives, I think, that suffers, it's our prayer life. And the devil fights that tooth and nail all the time. He just fights it tooth and nail. There'll always be a phone call. There'll always be distraction. You'll always start falling asleep. It just never ends. But you know what you could do? You could say, now, Lord, I, I, I can force this on my own. Lord, I can try to discipline myself, and you should. Lord, I, I, can, I can try to set, set times for this. But, Lord, you said, you said in the last days, and, Lord, you know we're there. Lord, you know, Lord, I could ask for a lot of things. I could ask for a pile of money. I could ask for sports cars. I could ask for fame. And, Lord... But, Lord, I, I'm asking for something that you said you would give. Lord, I, would you help me? Lord, you can help me to pray. You can help me get my prayers answered. Lord, pour it out on me. One last verse, Zechariah chapter 10. Zechariah 10. Isn't it funny? The Lord 
he just encourages us all over the place to do this. But again, we're in the book of Zechariah. And look what he says in Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1. Ask. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain. The picture is a dry ground. You know what the Lord said in Isaiah 44? He said, I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods, floods upon the dry ground. He said, ask for the showers. We sing that song, Showers of Blessing. David said in the Psalms, Thou didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think we're, we're afraid we're going we're gonna to ask for too much. We're asking for something really big. John Newton said, Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such. None can ever ask too much. You know, somewhere, somewhere, we got this thing in our head that, you know, the Lord just gives a little bit. And, and you know, and, and it's just, we, we just need to be satisfied with not getting our prayers answered. And I do just don't find that. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock. That's supplications. That's a whole next level. Knock and it shall be opened. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth him that knocketh it shall be opened. Ask ye of the Lord rain. The Lord said in the last days, in the last days, we're there. He says, if, if, you, if you want, he says, I will pour out something on that will help your spiritual life more than anything else. He said, I will pour out on you the spirit of grace and of supplications. I think that's something good we could ask for. He said, I'll pour it out. Would you ask him for that? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you asked that? And he answered it. Amen. Next thing you knew, you'd be saying, well, I don't know what happened to all these people in this church. They're, they're just praying left and right and getting answers to prayer. And, and you know who'd get the glory? He will. You know why? Because he poured it out. He says, I'm ready. He says, I got it. He said, I just wish you'd ask. Let's pray. Father, we need you. And, and Lord, we, we need help. I need help. Lord, um, boy, I, I sure would like to go up a whole big whop another level for you. Lord, I'd really like to get there. But Lord, you know, Lord, I don't do very good when I try to get there on my own. Lord, would you help us? Lord, you said you would pour out the spirit of grace and of supplications. And Lord, you started that at the day of Pentecost. You poured some things out. Now, Lord, would you help us? Lord, we ask for everything and you've encouraged us to ask for everything. But Lord, help us in the midst of our asking, help us to seriously, oh God, help us to seriously ask you for this. Help us to long for this, Lord. God, it sure looks like you want to give it. God, would you bless us with that spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, we pray. The piano is going to play. If God has spoken to you tonight, why don't you talk to him?
Lord, make this a reality to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.